Hi guys, it is going on dark now. It is absolutely, spectacularly depressing, just uh, beyond the pale winter day that has descended on Austin, Texas. It is now about 30 degrees outside. It was 72 at 9 o'clock this morning, nine hours ago, here on Sunday, March 2nd, 2014, the Lion of March, a day late, and lucky you, you get to hear a second, a second Doomsday Sermon from Doomsday Trailer, as your old Doomsday Prophet Hambone is uh, bouncing off the walls, and this little book just felt the universe delivered into my hand yesterday. I am the first person in the city of Austin, Texas to stumble upon this little book by a man I have never heard of named Stephen Emmett. Stephen Emmett, his book, 10 Billion. 10 Billion. Who is uh, Stephen Emmett is a scientist whose lab is at the forefront of research into a complex into complex natural systems and he is sounding the alarm 10 billion is a snapshot of our planet and our species approaching a crisis and a stark analysis of where this leaves us 10 Billion is not another climate book. 10 Billion is a book about us. And so anyway, what this book is, it's technically uh, 216 pages long. But what Stephen Emmett here, this guy is uh, the head of computational science at Microsoft Research. There you go, uh, out of out of Cambridge, and all these other credentials. What uh, Stephen has done in this book, guys, in this 216-page book, he has cut through the crap. He has cut through the crap. He has gotten rid of all those damn 50-cent words that me and uh, uh, Max Egan are always complaining about. To, to cut through the crap, and what he's done is on each page, he takes each page and boils it down to about one or two sentences. So you can, in fact, read this entire little book, this little book in, oh, maybe an hour, if you take your time. And I could, just, so in an hour, I could read you the entire book. I'm going to read you... Uh, the opening page and then we're going to skip through and pretty much read you the second half. The opening page. This book, 10 billion, this is a book about us. It is a book about you, your children, your parents, your friends. It's about every one of us. It's about our failure failure as individuals, the failure of business, and the failure of our politicians. It is about the unprecedented planetary emergency we have created. It is about the future of us. And so what he does for the first 129 pages, another way of saying about the first 129 sentences, is he brings us up to date. And this just came off the presses, guys. It just rolled off the presses uh, in the past couple of months. So he brings us up to date pretty much to today. To today. March 2nd, 2014, how our failure as a species has taken uh, this entire planet, including ourselves and our children, into a code red crisis as we are teetering on the verge of planetary collapse. And so, on page 129, he catches up 
and then he stares into his scientific crystal ball with all of his fellow uh, scientists and all of their computer models. Uh, this is what uh, Stephen Emmett has to say about uh, the future of us. All of the science points to the inescapable fact that we are in trouble. Serious trouble. And right now, we are heading into completely uncharted territory as our population continues to grow toward 10 billion. But one thing that is predictable is that things are going to get worse. There you go. So, what kinds of challenges do we face over the coming years as a consequence of our growing population and our activities? Okay. Moving through the list now, Jared Diamond pointing out that he said there's about a dozen of what Jared Diamond calls the ticking time bombs of the 21st century as this planet prepares to collapse. So we're going to let Stephen Emmett just run down a few of us. Cutting through the crap. Okay, the land problem is simple. We are already using 40% of all available land on Earth for food production. Yet, let's remind ourselves that demand for food is going to double at least by 2050. This means that pressure to clear many of the world's remaining tropical forest, rainforest, for human use is going to intensify every decade because this is predominantly the only available land that is left for expanding agriculture at scale unless Siberia falls out before we finish deforestation. By 2050, some two and a half trillion acres of land are likely to be cleared to meet rising food demands from a growing population. This is an area greater than the size of the United States, and accompanying this will be 3.3 billion tons per year of extra CO2 emissions that will result. So you take whatever we're pumping out now and add 3.3 billion tons per year. Okay, if Siberia does thaw out before we finish our deforestation of much of the remaining tropical forest, it would result in a vast amount of new land being available for agriculture, as well as opening up a very rich source of minerals, metals, oil, and gas. In the process, this would certainly completely change global geopolitics it would also inevitably be accompanied by vast stores of methane currently sealed under the Siberian permafrost tundra being released, accelerating our climate problem even further. Meanwhile, another three billion people are going to need somewhere to live. By 2050, 70% of us are going to be living in cities. This century, we'll see the rapid expansion of cities as well as the emergence of entirely new cities that do not yet exist. It is worth mentioning that of the 19 Brazilian cities that have doubled in population in the last 10 years, 10 are in the Amazon. 
all of this is going to use yet more land. The food problem is also simple. We currently have no known means of being able to feed 10 billion of us at our current rate of consumption and with our current agricultural system. Indeed, simply to feed ourselves in the next 40 years, we will need to produce more food than the entire agricultural output of the past 10,000 years combined. Yet, food productivity is set to decline possibly very sharply over the coming decades. First, I mean, why? There are three reasons. And first, and I'm not going to read, uh, I'm just going to read what I right, First, climate change. Second, soil degradation and desertification. Third is water stress. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then he starts saying we don't need to wait in the future. He just looks at a few of the indicators from the past few years. Uh, okay. But then there are, in addition, two other emerging crises that threaten the future of our food. The first is a phosphate crisis. The amount of food we produce is almost entirely dependent upon phosphate-based fertilizers. But phosphate reserves are finite and it is becoming apparent that we are going to run out of it almost certainly sometime this century. The question is when, not if. And because we are so heavily reliant on phosphates, when that happens, it is the end of food as we know it for the global human population. Okay, and then he t goes in there and talks about novel fungal pathogens that threaten to devastate crops. If or when this happens, we are in danger of famine-like starvation scenarios on a large scale. Okay, from the food, the little food ticking time bomb, let's go over there to the water ticking time bomb. The water problem is this. By the end of this century, large parts of the planet will not have anywhere near enough usable water. Billions of people are likely to be living in conditions of extreme water shortage as a result of increasing climate change, increasing food demand, and an increasing population. First of all, unprecedented large-scale changes to the planet's water cycle, which are already well underway as a result of human activity and human-induced climate change, are set to significantly increase this century. These changes are set to have a very significant negative impact on water availability. Second, our use of groundwater, essential for irrigating our food, is accelerating rapidly far faster than groundwater is or can be replenished. We face a highly dangerous and accelerating shortage of groundwater and efforts to technologize our way out of this problem through approaches such as water diversion, 
artificial groundwater recharge and efficient irrigation technologies have all failed. Moreover, fresh water supply stored in the planet's glaciers and snow cover are projected to decline alarmingly in this century. And even small rises in water temperature plus increasing extreme weather events causing both drought and flooding together with increasing pollution of water supplies through fertilizer, metals, and industrial agents are project projected to significantly affect water quality, making water unusable, and significantly exacerbate numerous forms of water pollution. I'm afraid our water problem is unavoidably going to have very adverse consequences for agriculture, human health, and ecosystems. From water, he takes a long look at the gas sucking car. I could, uh, I, I could have done a full rant, so I'm going to touch on some of these. Okay, from, from food and water, let's go over there to cars. You might not be surprised to learn that global car production, air traffic, and shipping are all set to ingre increase significantly this century. For starters, we are set to produce at least three times more cars this century than we did in the 20th century. And the global shipping and airline sectors are also projected to continue to expand rapidly every year, year on year, transporting more of us and more of the stuff we want to consume around the planet. That is going to cause enormous problems for us in terms of more emissions, more black carbon, and more pollution from mining and processing to make all of this stuff. But think about this. In transporting us and our stuff all over the planet, we are creating a highly efficient network for the global spread of potentially catastrophic diseases. So now you're talking about that. Oh boy. The combination of millions of people traveling around the world every day plus millions more people living in extremely close proximity to pigs and poultry. I'm living about 12 feet from a flock of 10 chickens. <clears throat> Making a new virus jumping the species barrier more likely means we are increasing significantly the probability of a new global pandemic. So no wonder then that epidemiologists increasingly agree that a new global pandemic is now a matter of when, not if. From global pandemics, let's go over there to the energy problem. Uh, talk about a ticking time bomb. Our energy problem is simple. We are going to have to triple at least energy production by the end of this century to meet expected, to, expected demand. To achieve this, we will need to build, roughly speaking, something like 1,800 of the planet's largest dams. Can you say Belo Monte? 23,000 nuclear power stations. He is a fan. This man uh, is a fan of nuclear power uh, with for what we've got to choose from. 
let's see, how about 14 million wind turbines and 36 billion solar panels? Or we could just keep going along with predominantly oil, coal, and gas and build those 36,000 new power station power stations that means we will need our existing oil, coal, and gas reserves alone are worth trillions of dollars. Our governments and the world's major oil, coal, and gas companies, some of the most influential corporations on earth, really going to decide to leave this money in the ground as demand for energy increases relentlessly? I doubt it. Okay, those were the easy ones. Now he lows over there to climate change, and I'm not going to spend a long uh, time on this. He spends several pages. All right, the emerging climate problem is on an entirely different scale than all those little peon problems I just talked about. We're getting to an entirely different scale of catastrophe. The problem with the, with the climate is that we may well be heading toward a number of critical tipping points in the global climate system. All complex systems, such as the Earth's system, are characterized by one important feature. A very small change can lead to an extraordinarily large and unpredictable impact that tips the system into an entirely different and unpredictable state. Let's just take one of these tipping points we're heading for, a rise in global average temperature of above 2 degrees Celsius. Then, then he talks about this absolutely horse shit joke that we're going to limit the, the heating of this planet to any 2 degrees Celsius. It is a joke. It is an absolute joke. <sighs> okay, a rise above 2 degrees carries a significant risk of catastrophic climate change that would almost certainly lead to irreversible planetary tipping points caused by events such as the melting of the Greenland ice shelf, the release of frozen methane deposits, or dieback of the Amazon. Uh, unfortunately, research shows that we look certain to be heading for a larger rise in global average temperature than any two degrees, a far larger rise. A four to six degree rise in global average temperature will be absolutely catastrophic. It will lead to runaway climate change capable of tipping the planet into an entirely different state rapidly. Earth would become a hell hole. In the decades along the way, we will witness unprecedented extremes in weather, fires, floods, heat waves, loss of crops and forests, water stress, and catastrophic sea level rise. Uh, there almost certainly won't be a country called Bangladesh by the end of this century. It will be underwater. 
large parts of Africa will become permanent disaster areas. The Amazon jungle could be turned into savanna or even desert, and the entire agricultural system will be faced with an unprecedented threat. Okay, so what does this mean most likely for the U.S. and Europe? Okay, we uh, may well look like something approaching militarized countries with heavily defended border controls designed to prevent millions of people who are on the move from entering because their own country is no longer habitable or has insufficient water or food or is experiencing conflict over increasingly scarce natural resource, resources. These people will be climate migrants or climate refugees. The term climate migrant is one we will increasingly have to get used to. Indeed, anyone who thinks that the emerging global state of affairs does not have great potential for civil and international conflict is deluding themselves. It is no coincidence that almost every scientific conference that I go to about climate change now has a new type of attendee, the Miller Terry. Okay, moving on from climate change. Every which way you look at it, a planet of 10 billion looks like a nightmare. And even more worrying, there is now compelling evidence that entire global ecosystems are not only capable of suffering a catastrophic tipping point, but are already approaching such a transition. So there we go. That is the state of affairs as of March uh, 2nd, 2014. So, the big question of the 21st century, what then are our options? I can see two options. The first is technologizing our way out of it. The second is radical behavior change. Technologizing our way out of it. This is the domain of the rational optimist. The rational optimist argument says that past predictions of doom, such as Malthus and Ehrlich, have turned out to be wrong, not least because our cleverness and our inventiveness have enabled us to technologize our way out of the population problem on every occasion. Setting aside the fact that we have technologized our way into our problems in the first place, let's look at the current ideas for technologizing our way out of them. There are basically five ideas. Green energy, nuclear power, desalination, geoengineering, and a second green revolution. And then he breaks down uh, all of these. And here is the, the bottom line on green energy, such as wind power, wave power, solar power, hydropower, and biofuels. The fact is that current green energy technologies are unlikely to be a viable planetary solution. It just is not gonna happen. There you go. Uh, let's see. Secondly, even if green energy technologies were a solution, which they're not, we would need to be embarking on a planetary-wide green energy program right now. 
and we're not. Okay, in the meantime, almost all of our energy will continue to come from fossil fuels. Oil, coal, and gas thus continuing to exacerbate the climate problem. Oh, boy. Okay, then this is his, his talk about nuclear power, his reluctant conclusion. I never thought that I would say this, but nuclear power seems to be the only existing technology that might solve our energy problem, at least in the short term, that is, for the next few decades. But for nuclear power to be a solution, we would need to be embarking on a global nuclear power program right now, and thank God we're not. Okay, then he talks about the absolute bullshit of desalinating seawater. Come on! Uh, then he goes from there about geoengineering. Geoengineering is essentially the notion that planetary scale engineering efforts might be needed simply to mitigate the worst consequences of the problem of the problems we safe. The, then he goes and he breaks all those down. The bottom line, the problem is that all of the current geoengineering ideas are completely unproven. All of them are extremely expensive. All of them come with significant knock-on effects. The long-term impacts of which are completely unpredictable. I, am pers I personally am not confident about geoengineering. In fact, I am deeply skeptical. As I mentioned earlier, there is currently no known way of feeding a population of 10 billion people. So the idea of a second green revolution to solve this problem is now a really very hot issue. What is certainly true is that we really do need a food revolution urgently because without one, billions of us are almost certainly going to starve. There you go. Then he talks about the absolute joke uh, about the green. What's his bottom line on the green revolution? The green revolution, meaning the, the former one, was not a story about clever people who worked out how to get more food from our fields. The truth is that the Green Revolution was a story about clever people thinking it was a good idea to buy every extra unit of food through energy and chemicals. The Green Revolution was a myth. We do need a food revolution, but it is a revolution that will require a radically new kind of science. Given where we are, it would be very prudent, in my view, to be a rational pessimist right now. So, as far as I am concerned, on today's evidence, technologizing our way out of this mess does not look likely. So, we need to do something else. If we are not going to be able to technologize our way out of this, the only solution left to us is to change our behavior radically and globally on every level. In short, we urgently need to consume less 
a lot less and we need to conserve more a lot more to accomplish such a radical change in behavior would also need radical government action but as far as this kind of change is concerned politicians are currently part of the problem not part of the solution yep yep uh so what politicians have opted for instead is failed diplomacy and then he goes through he just uh, he looks at climate change talks failed uh here's the i've mentioned how many of this one the convention on biological diversity whose job it has been for 20 years to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss failed uh, this list got these list of failures uh the list is a depressingly long one yes it is a depressingly long and the other thing he does is throughout this book he, he has all of these hockey stick charts he probably has about 25 of these hockey stick charts where about 1950 all of these environmental threats against this planet mainly global population went like this you know michael rupert was joking about this in his rant last week on Vice about the uh, the hockey stick over and over and over again. Okay, it looks like 20 years of words and inaction are set to continue with another 20 years of words and inaction. All the while, we are heading into deeper and deeper trouble. There you go. Uh, and then he starts looking at, uh, at these goddamn climate change deniers. Just for you climate change deniers, climate models will never be free from uncertainties. And then about all of this, the, you know, public opinion, just, just, he's basically talking the absolute denial. It's not just the climate change deniers. It is the denial uh, of 99.9% .9 of this planet completely denying climate change and every other single tipping, ticking time bomb uh, in, in this. Uh, you know, then he looks at the, uh, about how business, how the global uh, corporatocracy is going to yeah, help. Yeah, right. Okay, the cost of the business activities of the world's 3,000 largest corporations in loss or damage to nature and the environment in terms of forest ecosystems that we lose each year alone is estimated to be between $1.3 trillion and $3.1 trillion. These costs are externalities I was just talking about in my last rant. The cost to society of business activities that are currently not being paid for. Jesus, so he breaks down some of these externalities. These are all costs that will have to be paid for in the future by your children and by your grandchildren. Okay, in terms of business, uh, the only hope of remotely mitigating some of the problems we are increasingly going to face is a radical transformation of corporate culture. Do I think that will happen? No. Okay, from the global corporatocracy to each and every one of us keeping these sons of bitches in power by buying their products. So it's now up 
to us to turn this freight train around. What about us? I confess, I used to find it amusing, but now, I, I am now sick of reading in the weekend papers about some celebrity saying, I gave up my 4x4, and now I've bought a Prius. Aren't I doing my bit for the environment? They are not doing their bit for the environment, but it's not their fault. The fact is that they we are not being well informed, and that is part of the problem. We are not getting the information we need. The scale and the nature of the problem is simply not being communicated to us. And when we are advised to do something, it barely makes a dent in the problem. Then he, uh, he goes through, you know, some of these great uh, ideas to save the planet. His favorite one, pee in the shower. All of these are token gestures that miss the fundamental fact that the scale and nature of the problems we face are immense unprecedented and possibly unsolvable. The behavioral changes that are required of us are so fundamental that no one wants to make them. What are they? We need to consume less, a lot less, less food, less energy, and less stuff. Fewer cars, electric cars, cotton t-shirts, laptops, mobile phone upgrades, far fewer yet. Every decade, global consumption continues to increase relentlessly. And he goes from overconsumption, winding up, needless to say, his rant on a book called 10 Billion about what the, the hell are we going to do about overpopulation. Here we go. Saying don't have children is utterly ridiculous. It contradicts every genetically coded piece of information we can taint, we contain, and one of the most important and fun impulses we have. That said, the worst thing we can continue to do globally is have children at the current rate. Even if a global nuclear power program were set up to take care of our energy needs, even if geoengineering somehow took care of the climate change problem, and even if we consumed less, we would still at some point hit a brick wall if the human population continues to grow at anything like its current rate. And then he starts going through these population uh, projections where they keep talking about this horseshit 10 or 11 billion. I do just want to point out that if the current global rate of reproduction continues by the end of the century, there will not be 10 billion of us. There will be 28 billion of us. Where does this leave us? Let's look at it like this. And then he talks about if, if uh, we were an asteroid, if there was an asteroid uh, heading towards this planet, uh, that every that it would be the number one agenda item is to figure out how to keep the this asteroid from hitting us. But this is not an original thing. He's going. Guess who the new asteroid of the 21st century is? The problem is us why we are not doing more about the situation we are in. 
given the scale of the problem and the urgency, I simply cannot understand. And he talks about this bullshit uh, CERN lab uh, they're looking for the Higgs boson particle. And CERN's physicists are keen to tell us <coughs> it is the biggest, most, exper most important experiment on Earth. Well, it isn't. The biggest and more and most important experiment on Earth is the one we are all conducting right now on Earth itself. Only an idiot would deny that there is a limit to how many people our Earth can support. I remember Alex Jones saying one quadrillion the planet can support. Speaking of idiots. Okay. The question is, is it 7 billion, 10 billion, 28 billion? I think we've already gone past it. Well past it. We could change the situation we are now in. Probably not by technologizing our way out of it, but by radically changing our behavior. But there is no sign that this is happening or about to happen. I think it's going to be business as usual for us. As a scientist, what do I think about our current situation? Science is essentially organized skepticism. I spend my life trying to prove my work wrong or look for alternative explanations for my results. I hope I am wrong, but the science points to my not being wrong. As I said at the beginning, we can rightly call the situation we are in an unprecedented emergency. We urgently need to do, and I mean actually do something radical to avert a global catastrophe, but I don't think we will. I think we are fucked. There you go. Amen, Brother Stephen Emmett. Using the F word, that is the bottom line uh, of this man, uh, uh, of the, the head of computation lab at Microsoft Engineering, the bottom line of uh, the 21st century, we are fucked. And uh, anyway, this book, 10 Billion by Stephen Emmett, should be required reading for every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. My guess is that so out of 10 billion people, maybe 10,000 will read it. Anyway, so that's wrapping up my second Doomsday Sermon of the Day. As darkness descends and we head down into the 20s tonight here for this sermon. Bye, guys.